Hello all, I'm Michael Schertz. I'm coming to you from beautiful Boulder, Colorado, and I'm gonna be talking about testing for validity in molecular simulations. So let me uh, share my screen here. So the title of this talk is Testing Molecular Simulation Results for Physical Validity. And this work done by myself and Pascal Merz, a postdoc in my group. So um, first of all, uh, all of what we talk about, you can do downloads for tutorials on all of this. Jupyter Notebooks that allow you to uh, use the code and see how it's used, uh, see how it works. I get, get clone uh, the data from uh, this, uh, this uh, website and, and GitHub. Uh, we'll take a look at it a little bit uh, later. Uh, also run pip install physical validation. You may need to do pip install numpy, scipy, matplotlib, depending on what the state of your, uh, your, your, your setup is. And then try the notebooks out. But I'll be describing the sorts of things that we implemented in those notebooks. So, uh, acknowledgments first of all, uh, the majority of this work uh, was done by uh, Pascal Merz, a postdoc in my group. So, I want to make sure that he's recognized for all that he's done. Uh, this work is also supported by a grant from NIH as part of our work on simulation validity and GROWX. Uh, so outline, I'm going to talk about some physical assumptions and how we can validate those. Uh, for more information on this, you can see uh, the PLOS One paper from a couple years back. Um, and I'll talk about the Python module, module physical validation and how it implements these tests. And an uh, outlook and some conclusions. Okay, so physical, physically correct simulations are necessary for reproduction, reproducibility, and validity. Uh, you know, Leo, Toy, Leo Tolstoy said, happy families are all alike. Every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. But you know, the same thing applies for molecular simulations. Correct simulations are to some extent all alike. Every incorrect simulation is incorrect in its own way. What do I mean? Well, uh, correct simulations are all alike because uh, they need to conserve energy. Uh, they need to equal partition energy. There's a number of conditions they must satisfy. And uh, there's lots of ways to not satisfy the con those conditions. So the world of correct simulations is a much smaller subset of the set of all simulations. Uh, there are many ways to not conserve energy. There are many ways to not have equal partition of energy. There are many ways to not be Boltzmann weighted. Uh, there are many ways to create a non-equilibrium steady state, even though you intended to be simulating in an equilibrium state. And so we're gonna talk about different laws of physics that must be obeyed and how we can check to make sure those are indeed satisfied. So test one is the kinetic energy Maxwell-Boltzmann distributed. Uh, we know from basic theories in uh, physical chemistry that if you have a classical simulation, uh, or if a classical model of, of anything, if it obeys Newton's laws uh, and uh, it's sufficiently large, then uh, you need to have a kinetic, uh, i.e. that you have a Boltzmann, uh, you have a canonical ensemble. Uh, the kinetic energy must be Maxwell-Boltzmann distributed. So what that means is, yeah, the expectation is Maxwell-Boltzmann distributed, uh, so that the probability of observing a given kinetic energy is proportional to kinetic energy to the n minus two to the two uh, divided by two, where um, n is the number of degrees of freedom in the system times e to the minus beta k. Uh, so it'll look something like this. So you have 900 water molecules. So uh, 2,700 so minus three for center of mass removal. So 2,697 degrees of freedom. It'll look something like that. And the Maxwell, Maxwell Dose, Boltzmann distribution is a chi-squared uh, distribution, which shows up all the time in statistical tests. If you remember your, your uh, high school or college labs on fruit fly genetics and all that. Um, and so there's statistical tests available, such as the Komogorov Smirnov test. And uh, so K, K it's, it's a set of kinetic energies that you get from a trajectory, which you can treat as a distribution of energies. And so the null hypothesis would be that, uh, that the kinetic energy of Maxwell-Boltzmann distributed there. You can ask the question, given a confidence level alpha, what is the probability the null hypothesis is violated? So let's take a look at this. So um, uh, an another, So there's another uh, simpler version of the test you can run that is a little more interpretable, I think, sometimes. And that is uh, the average kinetic energy must be 1 half kBT times the number of degrees of freedom. This just comes straight out of uh, calculating an ensemble average of the kinetic energy given this distribution. Interestingly, the variance of the kinetic energy must be 1 half kBT squared times the number of degrees of freedom. 
And so what you can do, a given distribution of observed kinetic energy implies two temperatures, a temperature corresponding to the mean and a temperature corresponding to the standard deviation. So what you need to make sure is, are both of these consistent with temperature, whatever I actually meant to run? Uh, and so by looking at those, you can have, get, uh, looking at those you know, uh, temperature, estimated temperatures from the distribution, you can get a sense of what was actually happening if it's not the real thing. Uh, so an example of kinetic energy distribution. So here's the same uh, 600 uh, water molecules simulated with the velocity scale therm rescale thermostat and the variance and weak scaling thermostat with a, a relatively short uh, time constant. And so what you can see is, yeah, just, just tracing out the analytical Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution for this number of degrees of freedom. On the left side, it sure does look like the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution, whereas on the right side, it really is not uh, um, following that distribution very well. You've got a, a real deviation. It's uh, narrower than it should be. So uh, on the left side, then the temperature corresponding to the mean is within noise, 300 degrees. That's what it's simulated at. Uh, and the uh, temperature uh, corresponding to the standard deviation is you know, within noise the same thing. And so the p-value is only 0.21, which we cannot conclude, it seems you know, a, a reasonable inference that it, it might very well just be random noise. Now with the weak scaling thermostat, we see that uh, although the temperature corresponding to the mean is 300 degrees you know, within noise, again, so the average kinetic energy is correct. The distribution of kinetic energies is incorrect. T of sigma is uh, 222.6 which is definitely not uh, 300. The p-value here is 0.84 times 10 to the minus 83. So it is very unlikely that such deviations occurred by random noise alone. So, uh, you know, it could be that for some properties that you're computing, you get the right answer, even with a weak scaling thermostat, because they might only depend on the average kinetic energy. But if you're interested in, say, the heat capacity, you get uh, a wrong answer in this case, because heat capacity, um, uh, if you're measuring it by the fluctuations, obviously the fluctuations would be too small. Okay. Um, so another kinetic energy test you can do is look for equipartition. So you would expect that equipartition, uh, you get equipartition if you have an ergodic system, i.e. you have a homogeneous temperature, that all of the degrees of freedom will on average be uh, the same. The energy, but, uh, the kinetic energy will be divided between all of them. So uh, and this should be true no matter what the division is, uh, no matter what the functional or, or, or even arbitrary division is. If you just randomly divide molecules into groups, both of those groups should uh, individually, uh, the, the, the energy should be divided up uh, by equal partition. They should have on average the same energies if you have two equal sized groups. You can compare solute and solvent temperatures, calculate the corresponding temperature according to solute and solvent, uh, compare the temperatures of components of a liquid mixture. Uh, you know, if, if you look at a you know, mixture of chloroform and, and, and cyclohexane, do the chloroform and cyclohexane have the same uh, kinetic energies? They should. Um, uh, what can be even more uh, probing is looking at, uh, looking at internal degrees of freedom versus uh, translational degrees of freedom. So you got translational degree of freedom, rotation, and internal degrees of freedom. And if you're simulating gases, you can very easily get a case where the energy is not um, partitioning very well between the different degrees of freedom. And you can have perhaps very large translational degrees of freedom and a, a very small uh, internal vibrational degrees of freedom. And so properties you calculate will be incorrect. So this is another uh, good way that you can analyze your system to see if the physics are behaving correctly. Um, so test two, is the expected statistical mechanical ensemble being sampled? So you know if you're simulating the canonical uh, ensemble, you really do want your observations to be Boltzmann distributed, but how can you know if they are indeed, you know, being generated according to the Boltzmann distribution? So uh, here's uh, our test for this. You run the same system, everything exactly the same, except for the temperature. You change that one part of the configuration file, and you'll see that the probability of uh, simulation one, well, the probability of, of observing a given energy will be, according to statistical mechanics, one over the partition function, here's the partition function of system one, uh, times the density of states as a function of energy times e to the minus uh, beta one times e. Uh, but then what you also do is run another simulation at a second temperature, P2, uh, it's the exact same except for the second temperature. It'll again, uh, the, the probability of observing any energy will be one over the partition function. Uh, um, uh, now it's partition function two because it's system two. The density of states, which is exactly the same. That's not dependent on the temperature. It's dependent uh, on, on the other features of the system and e to the minus beta two e. So if we divide both sides, then we get the P1 over P2 is equal to Q1 over Q2. We still don't know what those are. 
but the density of states cancels out and that uh, the next constant, the proportionality would be E to the beta two minus beta one times E. And those beta ones and beta twos are known because those are the ones that we put into the simulation. Uh, and so take the logarithm of that and we see that that is equal to some unknown constant. We'd have to do more investigation to find out what that constant was, uh, uh, plus beta two times beta one times E. And so that's the key is that if we plot the ratio of these logs, there's other statistical tests we can do, but visually, you know, that's an easy way to see it, uh, plot the ratio of those, then uh, we get, uh, we'll get, if we fit it to a line, we'll get a, a line of known slope. And if it's not that slope, then something is going wrong. Uh, one, one side note here. Uh, remember that the average kinetic energy is not the temperature. The temperature is a constant that has to do with the average uh, energy, uh, the average kinetic energy of the heat bath. And so, the so when we talk about an NVT simulation, there it is a the, the temperature is a single number. And so, when we look at this beta two minus beta one, those are not something you get from the simulation. You don't average out kinetic energies to find what those are. Those are inputs to the simulation. That's important to remember. You can uh, get some weird results if you interpret the average kinetic energy, um, you know, an instantaneous temperature. You calculate a temperature, you know, at each frame. That that's not really the temperature. It's just something that's proportional to the instantaneous kinetic energy. The temperature is an input to the simulation, and so it's a fixed number. And so what we have here on this side is. Uh, literally just a constant that we know minus a constant we know. This is a slope times E. Okay, let's look at an example. Ensemble checking of water potential energy run in a NVT. So if we look at the velocity rescale thermostat, the analytically B1 minus B2 should be, you know, that number. The slope should be a 0 0.010402, which within noise is exactly that slope. And if you look, you, could, uh, you know, in fact, it's within 0.1 quantiles. Uh, I've, I've plot both a fit to simulation and the analytical ratio, and you don't, you, you really can't see any difference. They're essentially exactly the same. The blue line would be if I, if I histogram those two distributions and look at the logarithm at each point. Now, if we look at the Berenson weak scaling thermostat, then uh, we see a very different story. The analytical slope should be 0 0.01, but the actual slope is different by about 80%. And if you look uh, clearly, now you can see the difference between the analytical ratio and the fit to the simulation. There's a big difference there. It's off by, by 34.2 quantiles. So clearly there's something going on here that um, is problematic. So it turns out most thermodynamic ensembles can be checked. Uh, we've just been talking about checking NVT simulations by looking at fixed ratios of energy distributions at two Ts. Uh, but we can also look at fixed ratios of volume distributions at two different pressures in the NPT ensemble, and we get a very similar formula. Or uh, a fixed ratio of U plus PV enthalpy distributions at two different temperatures for NPT simulations. Uh, finally, this is interesting, you can actually look at a fixed plane of the uh, uh, the energy volume joint distribution ratio at pairs of temperature and pressure. So uh, here I've got an example of what this looks like. You're looking at the ratio of log of pressure uh, of simulation one UV uh, over uh, simulation two UV run at two different pairs of temperature. And, uh, you know, uh, T1, P1, and T2, P2, uh, you get a fixed plane. And uh, I've, I've shown both uh, um, well, data in the fit both with uh, a model system where you can uh, generate a lot of, of, of data covering the whole range and a Leonard Jones fluid where we only uh, get good ratios in a small range but you can see that yeah, in that range we get uh, a very close fit to that so you can you can do a very sensitive test you have to have the joint ratio right for it to be uh, entirely correct. Uh, Monte Carlo can be checked as well uh, because the potential energy and kinetic energy are se separable. So the formula is still valid if the energy is only the potential energy instead of uh, the internal energy. Uh, and you know, it follows the exact formula. And it's true for kinetic energy as well, but we have an analytical test for kinetic energy, so we don't need to do that. Uh, but it's great, so you could use it for Monte Carlo also. So grand canonical and semi-grand canonical ensembles can also use the same theory. Uh, if, if you have mu VT and grand canonical, you can look at a fixed ratio of particle number at two different chemical potentials or a fixed ratio of mu, of U minus mu N at two different temperatures. Uh, and finally, again, you can look at a fixed plane of the UN joint distribution ratio at pairs of T and mu. 
Same thing with the semi-grand ensemble. You can uh, you just replace uh, chemical potential by mu chemical potential, and now you look at fixed ratios of N1 distributions of the two different chemical potential differences. Clearly, N1 and N2 are related, so you can look at either N1 or N2. Uh, and the same things follows. Um, so our, our support for grand and semi-grand canonical is still in process in the current version, but if you want to get it working, let us know and we can get it working. We've got a good older version that we can um, uh, bring bring some of that in. So let me know if you want to use this for, for these sorts of simulations. Um, so, so that's an ensemble checker. That can be very powerful. And we've used it a number of times. You know, we're running hundreds of simulations. Uh, you know, something's going wrong. So we just run an ensemble check and we go, aha, you know, of these simulations, that's the one that, that's failing. Uh, and there's a lot of reasons it could fail. Uh, maybe it, uh, you know, it's trapped in a minima and then drops down to another minima halfway through the simulation. Uh, that can be hard to see if you're looking at averages, uh, but you will see that it'll violate the ensemble because it, 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 is, it doesn't, it's not sampling a full Boltzmann distribution of all the minima. It just you know, jumped between these two minima. So that immediately gets flagged as something that has not yet reached equilibrium. Okay, so test number three is, is my integrator doing what I think it's doing? Uh, so symplectic NVE integrators, which uh, most of the ones that are, that are used in most simulations are, uh, if, for example, uh, leapfrog or velocity, for, uh, leapfrog relay or velocity relay, um, they don't sample the true Hamiltonian uh, because they're using discrete time steps. But there's a really cool underlying mathematical theory to show that they do exactly conserve a different quantity called the shadow Hamiltonian. That's almost the Hamiltonian, but it differs by a factor that's order a delta t squared. Now it's a very complicated factor. You can't actually write it out analytically for anything else, more complicated than a harmonic oscillator. Uh, but it exists, you can prove that it exists. And um, so the fluctuation uh, 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 around the Hamiltonian is essentially the difference between the shadow Ham Hamiltonian and the true Hamiltonian. And it depends on the time step delta V integration uh, by a factor of delta T squared. So uh, in other words, if you run two simulations and you look at the rate uh, and the, the, the delta T squared, if you look at the, the ratio of the length of the time steps and square that, that will be equal to the ratio of the fluctuations uh, of the energy of energy one over energy two. Uh, the fluctu sorry, the fluctuations of the energies of simulation one and simulation two. So non-quadratic behavior indicates this lack of simplicity. Uh, so um, it allows you to check your integrator algorithm. algorithm. Is it actually doing what I anticipated doing? The interaction function. If the interaction function of is, is mismatched for the energy, then what you'll get is uh, non-conservation. F equals MA uh, won't be satisfied here, right? This is the integrator implementing F equals MA with a given Hamiltonian. So if you have a, a problem with the interaction for a function, there's a mismatch between the energy and forces. This will pick it up. Uh, constraint tolerance, because uh, it could be that your constraint tolerance is not really enough to enforce um, that F equals MA. So these are all ways in which you might not be integrating the way you think you, uh, you, think, way you, think you are. And so it becomes a powerful method of bug detection that, that uh, we've used a number of times in development of integrators in, in Gromax. So uh, here's an example of how this works. Does my cutoff scheme violate simplicity? So this is, these are data from a pure Leonard Jones liquid with an exact pair list. So there's no uh, errors in pair list updating. And I run the simulation with a series of different time steps from four down to 1.25. And notice that they're, they're halving by two each time. So I run the simulation the same length uh, but of course, I'm doubling the number of steps each time. Uh, and then I have a one nanometer cutoff, uh, and, but there's three types of cutoffs. A simple cutoff, whereas it's simply unmodified until it reach, reaches one nanometer and then goes to zero. A shifted cutoff, where I shift the entire potential down such that at the cutoff, it intersects at zero. So I, I determine what the energy would be at that cutoff and then subtract that from the entire function. So the force is the same up to that point. Uh, and uh, that's a shifted. And then a smooth function, which uh, you multiply by uh, a smooth function uh, at a certain point so that it uh, smoothly goes to zero at the cutoff. And so this is what the energies look like. So the blue, uh, they look you know, almost exactly the same up until you get to the very, um, the, get to near the cutoff. And then um, the potential, the, uh, the simple cutoff is in blue. The shifted cutoff is in orange and then the energy of the smooth cutoff is in green. So that's what they look like in the potential energy. Uh, if you look at the forces, then both the blue and the orange uh, are on top of each other there. So you can see uh, that those have a certain force and that the force 
it drops to zero over a uh, infinitely short range, whereas the, uh, the green curve goes smoothly. So what do these actually behave like when you apply this integrator test? So what we see is that the simple cutoff, um, this is wrong the whole way through. So what should be, you should, should be, you be looking for? Well, here, you know, we've got this ratio uh, of the, uh, the fluctuations in the energy uh, at the 2t time step and the fluctuation of the energy at the uh, 2 delta d uh, over the fluctuations of energy at 1 delta t time step. And so that should be equal to 4. And what we see for the simple cutoff, it simply is nowhere near the entire time. For uh, the shifted cutoff, it looks OK at uh, larger time steps. But then when we get down to smaller time steps, it starts to uh, not look as good. And the smooth cutoff, which uh, not only has continuous uh, potentials, but continuous forces is good throughout the entire range. So it can be a very powerful bug detector. Now, it could be that in many cases, the amount of error that's introduced here is negligible, um, but you wanna be able to understand what errors there are. Okay, uh, so uh, then we have a Python module for this, physical validation. Uh, there's two major parts, the test, kinetic energy, dot pi, uh, which has both a distribution test and the equipartition test, uh, ensemble.py, which runs the check ensemble and the different uh, ensembles, uh, the integrator.py uh, test, uh, which looks at the convergence as a function of time step, uh, and then class uh, re representing simulation data that communicates with the tests. And the important thing is we have parsers for Gromax, LAMPs, and also flat file or NumPy arrays with more to come. And if you're interested in just getting this working for additional ones, we'd be happy to help. But uh, with virtually any code right now, you can simply uh, do the, the flat file test by, you know, just, or NumPy array test, just load everything, you know, your energies and your volumes into arrays and pass those into the function. So uh, really for almost any, uh, any code, it's, it's very trivial to use this already. Uh, the one exception would be the equipartition tests which do require checking uh, the velocities of all the atoms. So those need to actually be able to read the trajectory files. So that's only implemented in a few cases. Um, so try the code. I really encourage you to come try the code. So you should go to uh, uh, the, our, our GitHub. Uh, um, there's the uh, Shirts Validation Workshop that has um, the uh, test code and test data you can play with. Um, and then uh, one of the other things we have here is uh, uh, Python notebooks that implement all these tests. So for example, checking an ensemble of water system using Gromex input files. So uh, I'll read your Gromex path. Uh, you'll check uh, the different um, ensembles and then it'll print, you know, kinetic energy distributions and checks of the energy. And yeah, finally, looking at the volume ratio test as well. Uh, you can check you know, whether your, your barostat is implemented correctly. And usually that's even harder than the um, usually that's harder than the, the, the thermostat by looking at here. And so in this case, it was using a, uh, I think the Barents and a weak coupling uh, barostat, so it's clearly not working correctly. So you can test all of the data that way. Um, so yeah, definitely try this out and see how it works in your own code. Um, a lot of the tests you can run on, on virtually any code uh, you try. Um, some, some you only want to be uh, implementing occasionally, but I think it's a very powerful way to just make sure that you're constrained by physics. You want the questions to be limited by, you know, your understanding of the molecular details of the system. You don't want to be constrained by problems with the simulations you've run. So uh, one example of a more interesting application, uh, echo partition in a solvated protein. So uh, this is just looking at trip cage mini protein, uh, solvated in water. And uh, People have talked uh, you know, a fair amount about different types of thermostats with different coupling schemes. For example, you could couple the entire system together, but some people recommend coupling the protein and the solvent separately using two different thermostats to do that, uh, or just even the solvent alone, right? If you, if you couple the solvent alone, that's really the, the most, you know, the closest you could get to um, the real physical system, right? Where you don't have magical thermostats, you know, coming, adding random noise to every single atom anywhere. Here, you know, if your system that you're interested in is really the protein, why don't you just uh, thermostat the water and then uh, let the protein gain kinetic energy through its interaction and collisions with the water? Yeah, so that's a possible way to, to thermostat the, the different degrees of freedom separately. So let's look at the results uh, here. So let me give you a tour of you know, what some of the, uh, the notation is. So we're plotting here the kinetic energy distribution of the protein alone. We're not as interested in the kinetic energy distribution of the solvent. We're just looking at the kinetic energy distribution of the protein. 
and the subscript R uh, uh, VR, uh, the, the, the VR uh, weak coupling and, and Nose Hoover are the different thermostats. One indicates a single a thermostat for the entire system. Two indicates two thermostats, one for the system, one for the solute. And uh, the, the um, uh, subscale S indicates we're just thermostatting the, uh, the solvent alone, but we're looking at the kinetic energy of the protein. And here, the darker color is the temperature corresponding to the average that I talked about at the beginning. And the lighter color in each of these cases is the temperature corresponding to the standard deviation, which again, should both be 300. We're running at 300 degrees. So uh, velocity rescaling, uh, which uh, is, is, is rigorously correct, um, it gets essentially both of these uh, temperatures right uh, in all cases. Uh, weak coupling is interesting. If you run weak coupling with a single thermostat, you actually get the kinetic energy distribution of the protein right because you're getting it's essentially the, the, the solvent is acting like uh, a bath and it's exchanging energy with the pro kinetic energy of the protein. So the kinetic energy of the protein is, is right. If you use two thermostats though, then uh, the average kinetic energy is right as it should, but the distribution of energies is, is greatly restricted. So that's in a case where if you run one thermostat, you're actually getting it wrong. Interestingly, if you thermostat only the, um, the solvent and not the protein, you get pretty much the right kinetic energy distribution. Again, because uh, the solvent is acting as a bath uh, that's exchanging energy with the protein. And so, you know, even if the, the distribution of the solvent energies is too narrow because it's acting as a bath, statistics mean that the system, which in this case we can interpret as the protein, will have the correct distribution. Um, if you look at the nose hoover coupling, uh, again, you get the correct behavior uh, if you only thermostat, uh, provide one thermostat. But if you uh, have two thermostats, then it turns out that the, um, the protein dis energy distribution is too broad. And we're still trying to figure out the mechanism of this. Uh, but it's, it's really quite interesting that that's the sort of thing that you get. There's some weird things with Nose Hoover. It's a very complicated, uh, a very deep mathematical algorithm. But uh, yeah, so, so having these tests allows us to do these sorts of analyses. Uh, you couldn't do the ensemble check here because the ensemble is for the, uh, uh, the, the, the uh, kinetic energies of the different parts of the system are separable, but the total energies are not. Okay, so uh, your outlook. So the physical validation module, we'd love you to check it out. Uh, we're interested in adding more parsers. So um, we're interested in working with you to create parsers for other programs. Um, do you experience violations of physical validity? We'd love to you know, see how that worked and, 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 and see you know, if it worked, did it not work? Uh, are, are there things that we could be detecting better? We'd love to talk about any of those things as well. So um, uh, contact us if you're interested. And uh, that is all I have to say about this. If you have feedback on this talk, please put the comments uh, uh, in, in the YouTube com tube comments. I'll probably, uh, the plan is to go through and re-record this in you know, six months or a year or so. And um, we will use those comments to make this presentation better and more useful, you know, and update you as, as the code uh, goes along. Thank you so much.